I'm Vinny Politan. Thanks so much for joining us here on Closing Arguments. We begin this hour with a look into the timeline of Brian Laundrie's disappearance. After a cross-country trip with his now-deceased girlfriend, Gabby Petito, Brian reportedly returned to Northport, Florida alone on September 1st in the white van the couple had been traveling the country in. Gabby was reported missing by her family on September 11th. On September 17th, the public information officer from the Northport Police Department joined our program and shared the news that Brian's family told police they had not seen Brian in three days. We have um, some developing information uh, as we speak. In the last few hours, his family did contact the Northport Police Department, and uh, they are claiming that they have not seen Brian in the last uh, three days. So we are now working to corroborate that information uh, so that we can find where now Brian is. Okay, so according to that theory, that would mean that the laundries told police the last time they saw Brian was September 14th. Now, after joining the search for laundry this week, Dwayne Dog the Bounty Hunter Chapman told Fox News he's following a new lead into Brian Laundrie's last known whereabouts. Chapman's tip alleges that Brian and his parents went on a trip to a campground about 75 miles away from their Northport home in early September. They registered to stay at this park. They were registered, went through the gate, they're on camera, they were here. And they did enter, they did come here. Allegedly, what we're hearing is two people left on the 8th, three people came in on the 6th, and two people left on the 8th. Now, we have not been able to independently confirm that this camping trip occurred, but neighbors of the laundries told Fox News that they did see the laundries packing their camper for a trip about a week after Brian returned from his cross-country trip on September 1st. It was How long it, after he got back, um, you know, alone in that white van, um, how long after that was this, when you saw them working on this other camper and getting ready to go away together? Yeah, I, I can't remember, uh, you know, the week, dates. Week and a half. Yeah, week, uh, prob yeah, probably week, week and a half. I agree with that. So yes. did All right, you start thinking about this whole timeline now, right? So on the, on the Dog Chapman timeline, along with these neighbors, it's in sync that the three of them are packing for this trip on the 6th of September and then returning on the 8th. Now, according to Dog Chapman, he says only two people return on the 8th. That does not necessarily jive with what the parents are saying and saying to police that on the 14th, Brian was home, and that's when he went for this hike without his cell phone, without his wallet at that Reserve that they have been searching for days and days and days. Different location than that 75-mile trip. Let me bring in my guests tonight. They've done a lot more investigating than I've done in my lifetime. Joining us in Los Angeles, California, retired FBI Special Agent Bobby Chacon. And joining us tonight from Dallas, Texas, retired police commander and the host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King. Great to have you both here tonight. First of all, Mike King, your reaction to these two separate timelines and, and what it means and what it should mean for investigators going forward here. Yeah, you know, I guess I have a couple of thoughts in this regard. And the first one is this emotional thought of mine that says, how on earth do you go on a camping trip when the love of your life is not to be found anywhere. The woman who's living in the basement of your house with your son suddenly is gone, but he has her vehicle. That is so troubling to me, Vinny, and I don't understand 
any reasons behind going somewhere other than going to the police department. And, and I, I'm having a hard time getting over that. Number two is, I think, how cool is it that social influencers can have contact and the ability to get information, but is it appropriate that a social influencer is out doing police work instead of just giving that information very discreetly to law enforcement to follow up on. Uh, Bobby Chacon, your thoughts about these timelines and, and what it may or may not mean. I mean, if you've got a neighbor seeing them packing to go on this trip and in that, in that interview, the neighbors are saying, this is kind of unusual, you know? Yeah, it was, it was pretty regular for mom and dad to head off, but mom, dad, and Brian together was a little unusual. And then you've got a dog Chapman saying um, that only two leave that campsite on the 8th. Well, yeah, Vinny, I mean, look, look, if we take what you gave us as fact, which I don't, but, you know, I don't think what Doug Chapman might say as, as reliable. But if that's the case, if they went, if three people went into Fort DeSoto Park, and that's a park I've been in many times. I, I graduated college in Tampa, which is the next county over. So my family has spent time in Fort DeSoto Park. It's a very big water-based park, but it, you know, if if three people went in there and two come out, meaning those two being his parents, they come home without him, and then they send police to the reserve, obviously it makes it look like they dropped them in one place and they appointed the, the police in another. If the, if the timelines as you put them out there with the information coming from the people that it comes from is reliable, then it certainly makes it look like, you know, maybe they dropped him off in Fort DeSoto Park and maybe they pointed the police in the to the Carlton Reserve, which is obviously uh, a diversion. That's you know that's that's a lot of uh, faith in that information that's coming in. Well, let's let's put this up. And again, as we said, none of this has been confirmed independently by Court TV. But this is what uh, neighbors are saying publicly about this trip. Uh, it's what Dog Chapman is saying publicly. You know, he says he's looking, um, and we know what the parents said publicly. And it, it wouldn't necessarily jive. But I want to put on the screen. Uh, where exactly this campsite is relative to the Laundry's home. If we could drop all those letters on the screen, there you go. So the Laundry's home is south of, of, of Fort DeSoto Park. Fort DeSoto Park, 75 miles north of there. Um, and let's zoom in and, and let folks take a closer look at, at Fort DeSoto. And as we're looking at this, Bobby Chacon, you know it a lot better. You've been there. Describe yeah. this area to us. What is it like? How big is it? How many people go there? Um, what do people go there to do? What is Fort DeSoto Park all about? Well, it's a it's at the very tip of the peninsula that houses St. Petersburg, the city of St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, in Pinellas County. And it's at the very tip of that. And so you see that long bridge you have to go over coming from the south, the, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. And, and it's it's a peninsula that's that's com, uh, popular in boating and fishing and beachgoers. So it's it's not the it's it's almost the antithesis to the Carlton Reserve, which is very wooded and, and swampy. Fort DeSoto is kind of on the water. It's really nice water there. Um, there are beaches. There are small islands all over the place that you can camp out in. It's a very big um, area, just as Carlton Reserve is, but it's very different than Carlton. The, the, the topography is very different. Um, it's beaches. It's brushlands. Um, it's not the heavy, swampy area that you find in the Carlton Reserve. Many people go to Fort DeSoto Park. It's a state park. Um, people have those state park passes that they can go to all the, the different state parks. You can camp overnight. You can go for the day. Um, there's a lot of sports activities that take place Let in me there. ask you this, Bobby. Um, can you live off sure. the land there? Can you live off the land? You can, um, but it, it's much more difficult to stay hidden in, in Fort DeSoto as opposed to, the, say, someplace like the Carlton Reserve or the Appalachian Trail, um, where because a lot more people, I think, go to the Fort DeSoto Park. It's not as much of a nature preserve as the Carlton Res Reserve is. Um, many more people go, I believe, to Fort DeSoto Park. It's much more open, um, although there are camping areas and there's some remote places, but it's not as hidden, I think, as the Carlton Reserve, if you were just comparing the two. Uh, Mike King, I, I want to put some pictures up on, on the screen uh, from Gabby Petito's Instagram. And it, it's fascinating because this picture taken Fort DeSoto at the historical, historical Fort DeSoto. I mean, Brian Laundry behind bars, right? Um, but, they, so, but, we, but what this does prove is that we know that he's been there before. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. And, and, and what a perfect place if you are going to stage something 
to, to go in. And perhaps there were three people going in in a vehicle. Uh, I'd like to see the imagery that they're saying is an absolute that two are there. Is it that there were three and one was behind the headrest and a driver and, and we just didn't capture him in the picture? Was an individual laying down on a seat as part of a bigger scam to, to make it look that way? Why did they pick that? Is it because it was socialized and it's out there and people are looking for it? it it's so interesting. And, you know, we're going to see criminals or people when they're involved in crime go to places that they're familiar with because they understand the environment. They understand the location they're in and how they can get around in those places. It'd be interesting to me to see if campers in the area start reporting thefts of food or things like that from their coolers outside of their cabins. Um, but, but we're going to start seeing some signs if, in fact, this is happening. But like Bobby was saying, this area uh, at the fort is much more populated. They've got cameras. The risk for an individual to be able to go around and not be seen there is greater than back in the reserve. But the reserve, man, every expert that looks at that place says there is no way that somebody's going to be able to survive out in that thing on their own. And not only from predatory problems, the, the animals, the alligators, but like one farmer said, the bugs would carry you off. Bobby, let me ask you, if, if you're at Fort DeSoto, can, if you are there, can you get somewhere else from there? Is there, is there a way to jump on a boat? Is there a way to, to, to get to yeah, some other place? Yeah, I mean, if you have place? a boat, sure, if you have a boat available to you or if you hire a boat, yeah, I mean, a lot of people do bring their boats into the park. Um, but, you know, you have to have that boat. You have to have somebody with a boat. But certainly you just saw a photo of, of Gabby, I believe, walking along the beach in, in Fort DeSoto Park. Many people can beach their boats and, and have a picnic, you know, and come and go on their boat. So, sure, if he had access to a boat, he certainly could have left from that park. So, again, this is a big if, but uh, Bobby, as a retired FBI special agent, should we presume tonight that the FBI has checked all this out already? I mean, if, if I think it's a yeah, I think it's a safe assumption to to make that to, to make that guess. Um, and, and I think that you you know, in my opinion, he's probably not there. That's not a place that I would think he would go to. Um, he's got too much connection there. He's going to find a place that he he doesn't have as much connection to. It would be a good place to stage a diversion if his parents, if you know, and I, and that's a, a supposition on my part. But if if his parents did help him plan this. And, and, you know, it's another diversion. If they wanted to give him as much of a head start on law enforcement as they could, the Carlton Reserve being one diversion, Fort DeSoto Park being another diversion, and, and w when law enforcement's searching all these places, he's actually somewhere else, and, and he has that big head start. And, and Mike King, that's the other thing. We, we can't forget the timeline here. I mean, on September 6th and September 7th and September 8th, nobody knows who Brian Laundrie is. Nobody knows who Gabby Petito is. It's not a story. I mean, it's, 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 we have to keep that in mind. So if, and again, this is a huge if, folks. We have no idea, but we're searching, and, and, and the, the, the world is searching for this, for this guy. If he is there yeah, yeah, and I runs mean, into people, they wouldn't be looking for him. They may not even notice him. That's right. And, and you think about it, I mean, the way that we can travel and the speed at which we can travel, he doesn't need to jump on a plane. In 24 hours, he could be in Monterey, Mexico. He, in 20 hours, he could be up near the border of the Appalachians, 12 hours on the southern border, 20 hours on the northern border. I mean, this, this person, if there is a desire to get out of Dodge, he can cover a lot of ground in the period of time. And we're talking days, as you said, Vinny. Let me ask one more question about uh, Fort DeSoto. Um, Bobby, if you're in there, I mean, is there a bus that you can jump on? Is there, a, is there another way not out? That I, not, not that I recall. I think there might be a shuttle. I mean, it's a state park. So, you know, there are state park rangers. It's under the control of the state park system. So there are rangers in there and there are people who have, you have to have permits to go to certain areas of the park and things like that. But I, not, not as I recall that there was no, um, you know, like public or mass transit. I mean, they might be to the to the front entrance to it, but certainly not into into the deeper areas of the park. And what should we read uh, today, Bobby? Because today is really the first time we didn't get any sort of an update. The FBI is fully taking this thing over, um, and and they're not saying anything. And uh, you know, we, we were used to getting information each day about where they are in the search. Now we've got silence. So should we read anything into that? 
No, I don't think so. I mean, look, that, that this typically happens when the FBI takes over a case. You, the, the FBI does not normally want a lot of things going out. And, and, and when I was an investigator, the only things I wanted to go out into the public arena were things that I deemed strategically beneficial to my investigation. And that's it. And I had victim and witness specialists who dealt with the family's needs. And they would sometimes ask me if I could authorize release of certain information to the family. Sometimes I would, sometimes I wouldn't, depending on the situation with the family. But my main objective was to go and get the perpetrator. And the only information that went public was it benefited my objective, benefited my objective of getting the bad guy in jail. And so that's that's the only reason. So that's generally the FBI's thing. So now you, you see a, a little bit of a clampdown of information. And so that that's why you're seeing that. But remember, there's two different investigations going on here. One is the autopsy and the murder investigation of, of who we will ultimately charge with murder. And the other one is the manhunt for this individual who's a person of interest. Um, so, so those are two separate kind of distinct things that are going on. We, we need to kind of catch him and get him on the credit card thing and then see if we can't uh, large murder charges against him. Um, but the murder investigation itself is going on. They're up there in Wyoming with the medical examiner. They're going over the results. They're looking at his hard drives, you know, and so those two things are happening simultaneously, but they're kind of separate. Mike King, from your experience, where do you think the break is going to come from? I, I think, number one, it's going to be people reporting, and that's the beauty, I guess, of the show like this, Vinny, is that the word's getting out to millions and millions of people, and there are lots of eyes looking for Brian Laundrie. I think that's going to be one thing. you got to hope that somebody who knows something, whether there is some involvement by family members that they know something they haven't shared, that at some point conscience is going to step in and say, we got to share more. Maybe it becomes negotiated con conscience. I don't know. And and then as more information comes out of the autopsy that's going on, I think it's going to start pointing to more information about whether we really do have a person of interest or an individual who's a suspect in a homicide. And, uh, and so we're going, to, we're going to learn more there. The other thing that I think is really interesting is this return to the residents to get DNA. There's a lot happening behind the scenes that we're not aware of, I'm sure, because they needed to get DNA to be able to, to, to either exclude or to include uh, certain DNA. All right, Bobby Chacon, Mike King staying with us. Um, when we come back, we're going to open up tonight's Unsolved Case File.